right, so here we've got some beautiful lilies uh, with huge uh, sex parts, big sex organs on that. All right, uh, now, before we talk about uh, flowers, uh, we want to mention, and we wrote it here, that there are some flowering plants that can reproduce asexually or vegetatively. In other words, without sexual reproduction. And uh, there are a number of examples of this, and we can see it on the next page, N2. On N2, so some of you have seen a potato, and you will notice if your potato sits around in the cabinet long enough that uh, roots start to grow from, out of the potato, and so do leaves. So in this case, this is called asexual or vegetative reproduction. In fact, you could take a potato, cut it into pieces, and uh, you, you may have heard this expression, eyes. The eyes on the potato are little kind of little bumps. And uh, each little uh, piece of a potato that's got at least one of those, quote, bumps or eyes, that will grow and start to form roots or leaves. So you could take that potato and create, uh, you know, five, six different plants out of it. Uh, another thing people have done is you may have taken the top of a carrot and stuck it in water, and it'll start to grow leaves as well. This is uh, reproducing, making more plants uh, asexually, uh, without re uh, uh, sexual reproduction or vegetatively. Uh, some plants, uh, some of you are familiar with how you can take a piece of a cactus. Is anybody familiar with that? So some people will take succulents like a cactus. They just take a piece of it, put it in water, and it grows into a whole cactus plant. Uh, another example above is uh, if you've seen how strawberries grow. So strawberries and other types of similar plants have these roots that run horizontally, and then they give rise to new baby plants. These are called runners. Has anybody ever heard of a spider plant? If you'd heard of a spider plant, it sends out these roots that form new baby plants. And again, all of these are examples of, of asexual reproduction or vegetative reproduction. But obviously, back on page N1, uh, the reason why flowering plants have flowers is that's how they reproduce in most cases. So let's talk about the structure of a flower. And I colored my picture. You'd say, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> you can color it in, too. Uh, all right, so looking at the picture, what are the principal parts of a flower? <clears throat> so uh, we're going to see that these outer structures here are called sepals. And then there are the so-called petals. And then there are the male parts of the flower called stamens. And in the very center of the flower is the female part of the flower called the pistil. Now, just watch you through all that. Let me do that a little bit more slowly, more carefully. Let's start with the very center of the flower. In the very center of the flower, there is typically one pistil. There are some flowers with mul multiple pistils, but usually there's one. That's the female part of the flower. Now, obviously, the challenge in, all, in classes like biology is all these words and how do you remember them. And uh, you do need to know the pistil is the female part. I, I will give you a suggestion. <laughs> you may have a better idea of how to remember. Does anybody have a suggestion of how to remember pistil is the female part of the flower? Okay, I have a, a really silly one. And it may only work for me, so it may be of no benefit to you. But I'll, I'll share with you uh, what I know. Uh, there is a very old expression, you know, something even that's older than me. It goes back to earlier generations. And they would use this expression of a pistol packing mama. Has anybody ever, er, ever heard that expression? No, one person? You've never heard it? You have? No. Did anybody ever hear that expression? All right. Oh, now you have it. A pistol packet mama. That's like a, a woman who's carrying guns. Uh, think of kind of Angelina Jolie with a gun. All right? So uh, because there was this expression, pistol packet mama, so because I had heard that, and again, that even predates me when I was a kid, but I'd heard that, so a mama's a female. Pistol. 
So I just remember pistol pack and mama. Okay, so the pistol. Now it's actually pistol is spelled differently because that's a pistol, P I S T O L. That means like a gun. This is P I S T I L. But that's how I remember it. Now, again, you might say, that's so stupid, I would never use that. Okay, fine, you don't have to use that. I was just trying to offer you some way of remembering it. Now, in the pistol, part of the, uh, uh, the female part of the flower, the very top part is called the stigma, and it's sticky. So it's the sticky stigma. And you'd say, well, why is it sticky? Because we're going to see pollen sticks to it. Pollen sticks to it. All right, now, the, uh, right below the sticky stigma is this long, slender part called the style. And then the bottom of the pistil, the female part of the flower, is enlarged, and where it's enlarged is called the ovary. Now, inside the ovary of the uh, female part of the flower, the pistil, is one or more eggs, or ovules. An ovule is like an egg. And in, some, in the ovaries of some flowers, there's just one, one, large, one ovule or macrogamete, big sex cell. And in other uh, ovaries, there are hundreds or thousands of eggs. So it varies. But, so in that respect, the ovary of the flower is similar to the ovary of a woman. There are eggs in a woman's ovaries. There are eggs or ovules uh, in the ovary of this uh, flower. And that's the female part. Now, surrounding the female pistil are usually many stamens, multiple stamens. The number of stamens is related to whether it's a monocot or dicot. If it's a monocot, it's going to have three or multiples of three stamens. If it's a dicot, it'll be four or five or multiples of four or five. So there's usually multiple stamens. Uh, the stamens are the male part of the flower. The very top of the stamen is called the anther, and it's usually yellow or orange in color because it's covered with yellow or orange colored pollen. Pollen are the microgametes. That's like the sperm. <clears throat> now, uh, right, this uh, anther has a very long, what's called filament. So the stamen, or male part of a flower, consists of this uh, filament and the anther. Now, of the parts of the flower that I've described so far, the most important things are the following. The anther of the stamen, you should know what the anther is of the stamen, that's where the pollen is. And for the pistil, the most important thing is the sticky stigma and the ovary. So in other words, I'm just trying to give you a way of prioritizing what words you should learn. You should know them all, but you certainly should know what I just said. Uh, now, uh, surrounding the stamens are petals, and the petals usually are brightly colored. At least they're brightly colored if uh, it, the uh, uh, plant is insect pollinated. If it's wind pollinated, then the pe uh, petals uh, are not very attractive. They don't have colors because the wind could care less whether it's colorful petals or not. And then just outside the petals are the sepals. Now, the sepals may be the same color as the petals. They may be green, or they may be the same color as the petals. And you're, you're probably thinking, I never heard of the sepals. I've heard of petals, but I haven't heard of sepals. I'll clarify that in a moment, just before I do. All of the petals, collectively, are called a corolla, like the Toyota Corolla. All right, so all the petals are collectively called the corolla of the flower. And all of the sepals are collectively called the calyx of the flower, C-A-L-Y-X, calyx. All of these terms, incidentally, are written and underlined lower down. Now, let me try to use this flower to explain what it is we're looking at. All right, so I don't know to what extent you can see it. Let's see if it shows up here. All right. All right, so uh, this tall thing right here, this is the pistil in the very center. The very top is the sticky stigma. This is the long style. And way down here, and I don't want to tear open the flower at the moment, is the ovary way at the bottom. It's down in here. Now, surrounding this very tall pistil, these are the stamens. There happens to be six of them. 
Here's three here, and three here, there's six. All right? So because there's six, we know immediately it's a monocot, because six is a multiple of three. So this is a monocot, and uh, this happened to be a lily. And uh, this, this at the top of the stamen is the anther, and it's kind of yellow, because uh, got, uh, got, this is covered with pollen. And I'm sure that you've gotten some of this yellow or orange pollen. Has anybody ever gotten flowers like this? Some people actually cut these things off because they uh, cause a mess with all that pollen. Uh, now, these are the petals, of course. However, let's look at these petals. Uh, all right. Now, you'll notice, let's count the petals. One, two, three, four, five, six. A multiple of three. But let me show you something. Let's see if, I can do, see if I can do this without destroying the flower. Can you see these three? Yeah. Did everybody see those three? No. Those are the three petals. These are the three outer sepals. They have the same color. See that? There's the inner petals and the outer sepals. I said that the sepals may be green, or they may be the same color as the petals, but they're outside. They are uh, outside the... Uh, Oh, I just broke one off. Okay, so uh, that, that's uh, now. And incidentally, another way we would know that this is a monocot, look at the leaf. Can you see the vessels are in straight lines? And in this dicot, they're branched. Now, we've been just describing this uh, lily. Let's take a look at a uh, rose. All right, so uh, we have the uh, rose. Now, this hasn't fully opened up yet, so we can't see the uh, pistils and stamens. They're way on the inside. And uh, you, you would actually see that everything about a rose, I mentioned this earlier, is in a multiple of five. Now, these are the petals. They're red. All right? You can see there's a multiple of five if I were to count them. Where are the sepals? Those are these green things here. And you know that because when you've seen a rosebud, See the rosebud? These are the green sepals, and let's let me pull these sepals apart. Let's we'll count them. There are I, probably, I just tore one off. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real good experiment when you I'm destroying them. Okay, but there were five. Can you make that out? Yeah. yeah. There were five. Everything is a multiple of five. So the sepals are outside the petals. They may be green, or they may be the same color. So uh, here's a, another example where I could destroy this one as well. Let's see. Okay, I think you can make out there are five here. See that? Five. All right, so uh, that, that's when you have a rosebud, the sepals open up. And then the petals open up, and finally the entire flower is open. Now, uh, these, of course, are insect pollinated because all these colors and smells are designed to attract the attention of an insect. Let's uh, see what we wrote here on page uh, N1 at the bottom. So we, uh, we point out exactly what I've just told you already. Uh, the sepals are collectively called the calyx, and the petals are collectively called the corolla of the flower. On page N3, on page N3, there are three pictures of flowers here on N3. All right? And uh, here's a flower, here's a flower, and here's a flower. Now, this is called a regular flower. And it says the regular underline right there, and it says it right here. This is a regular flower. What's a regular flower? The petals and the other parts of the flower are similar. They are similar in shape. So all the petals are similar in shape. That's called a regular or regular shaped flower. This is an orchid. That's an orchid. And you'll notice that the, are, are, I'll ask you as a question. Are the petals all the same shape? No, they're not. So that's called an irregular flower. It's symmetrical, it's beautiful, but they are not all in the same shape. And then, on this uh, flower right here, 
All the petals are joined together. This is called a corolla tube. We had said that all the petals together are called the corolla, and here they form a tube, a corolla tube. Can anybody think of a flower that looks like that? An Easter lily. You know what an Easter lily is? Around Easter time, don't people commonly get these white Easter lilies and they look like this? Or a trumpet flower. You've heard of a trumpeter flower. They have a corolla too. All right, so we've described that. Now let's take a look, and we're not I'm not going to cover everything here. Let's look on page, um, let's see, on page N4. On N4, another way that we describe flowers, not only by whether the petals are the same shape or not the same shape, and if they're the same shape, it's called a regular flower, or if they're different shape, they're called irregular, but uh, if a flower, if inside the flower there are both stamens and pistils, which there usually are, it's said to be a perfect flower. And most flowers are perfect flowers. This uh, lily has the pistil and it has the stamens both. It is a perfect flower. So does a rose. However, there are flowers that just have uh, either the stamens inside it or the pistils inside it, but not both. These are called imperfect flowers. Now, if it's got only stamens on the inside, it's called a staminate imperfect flower. If it's got only pistils inside it, it's called a pistillate <coughs> imperfect flower. Now, you'd say, well, how does that work? Well, we're going to explain how it all works, but we're just showing you that there's variations in flowers. Okay, now that we've learned the difference between a regular and an irregular flower, that has to do with the shape of the petals being the same or different, and we've described what a perfect flower and an imperfect flower is, whether it has both stamens and pistils or it has only the stamens or only the pistils. Let's see how flowering plants actually do it by looking at page N6. Okay, so on page uh, N6, Pollination and fertilization in angiosperms. Now, everything I'm about to describe is written here. Let's just look at the picture down below. All right, so what am I trying to show you? Okay, here's a flower. Let's get our orientation. Uh, right here in the center is the female pistol. Uh, this at the top is the sticky stigma. Here's the uh, uh, st uh, style. This is the ovary. Here in the ovary is an egg or an, uh, or an ovule. Now, surrounding this are the uh, stamens that have the, on the very top of the stamen, are the anthers covered with pollen. <clears throat> now, in this picture, it shows that some of the pollen, which is really uh, like s s a sperm in a sense, it doesn't have a flagellum, it can't move, but uh, it's a microgamy. The, uh, it shows this pollen being transferred from the male part of the flower, the stamen, to the sticky stigma of the female part of the flower. This process of the pollen being transferred from the male to the female part of the flower is called pollination. Now, how is that pollen, how does the pollen get from the male to the female part? It's either by the wind, or by insects that are transferring it. Now, even though in this picture it shows the pollen going from the male part of this flower to the female, in fact, if it was, let's say, the wind, the wind's going to tend to blow pollen from this flower to a different flower, to another flower. And it will stick to the sticky stigma of another flower. Now, when I say another flower, it's only going to work if it's going from one rose flower to another rose flower. But commonly, people will plant many roses in the same area. Or, let's say it's an insect. So it doesn't mean that the insect is transferring the pollen from this uh, uh, male part of the flower to that, to that very same female, to the female part of that same flower. The insect might get some of the pollen on its body, this bee, let's say. And then the bee flies to the next rose, right, on that same plant or at a different plant. 
And some of that pollen that it had picked up on its body, it brushes against the sticky stigma. So it doesn't mean that the pollen is going really within that same flower. It could be just being transferred from a, a flower on one rose plant to a, a rose flower on a different rose plant. Could be the rose plant that's a block away. And it was just carried by either the wind or the insect. So in fact, that's usually how it works, is it's dispersed. All right, now, uh, once this uh, 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 pollen is transferred to the stinky stigma, which is called pollination, what, this, this next part will blow you away if you haven't heard this before. The pollen grain starts to grow a tube. And this is called a pollen tube. Here it's starting to form a tube. And here it's forming a tube. And it grows this tube all the way down to the egg or ovule. And then uh, what happens is this, in a sense, like a sperm or microgamete, uh, the, uh, these chromosomes actually move down this tube and they unite with the chromosomes in the egg. This is called fertilization. Fertilization is when the microgamete unites with the macrogamete. That's called fertilization. Now, you may be hearing this and thinking, this is so like weird. Actually, it's very similar to humans. You'd say, what do you mean? If a man has intercourse with a woman, you'd say, OK and he releases sperm into her body. In a sense, she has been pollinated. <laughs> All right, the sperm is in her body. But it's not until the sperm unites with the egg in her body that fertilization occurs. Does everybody follow that? So the fact that, some, uh, that sperm is released into her vaginal canal, it's not until that sperm unites with the egg that there's fertilization and an embryo starts to develop. So uh, first a woman's pollinated, and then there's fertilization of her egg. This, the pollination is simply the transfer from the male to the female part. And this fertilization is when that microgamete unites with a macrogamete, where the, it's something similar to a sperm uniting with an egg. That forms a zygote, an embryo. Now this uh, uh, embryo that uh, it's going to develop here uh, is actually going to become the seed. That's going to become a seed. <clears throat> uh, all right, so we've talked about so far the difference between pollination and fertilization. Let's take a look at page N7. So on N7, this picture, the picture on N7 is just a bigger view an enlarged view of the same thing we just said. All right, here it shows the pollen. It's being transferred to the stinky stigma. Uh, that's called pollination. It's either the wind still carrying it or an insect. Here it shows uh, what's growing from that pollen is a pollen tube. And it grows all the way down to the ovule or egg in the ovary. And when the microgamete unites with the macrogamete, Similar to a sperm uniting with an egg, that's called fertilization. Now, right above, here's what I wrote. So, this is what gets interesting. The microgamete, which is the pollen, unites with the macrogamete, right, the ovule, the egg, and that's going to become a little baby plant, an embryo, which will become a seed. A seed is a baby plant. When you put a seed in the soil, it, it grows into a big plant. Now, let me ask you a question in terms of humans. If a sperm of a guy unites with the egg, if there's fertilization in a woman's body, all right, so this is, that means she's got an embryo that's growing in her. Does that cause some changes in her body? Yes. Yeah, it causes a lot of changes. Uh, what happens to the size of a woman? She gets a lot bigger, all right? So there are all kinds of changes. Well, the same thing happens here. When this embryo starts to develop, the ovary, you'd say the ovary, the, you'd say, what's that? This is the ovary, right? This is the ovary, and this embryo is inside here. That ovary starts to grow larger, and it enlarges into what we call a fruit. A fruit is an enlarged ovary. Think about that the next time you have a fruit. You are, that's an enlarged ovary. 
And what's inside that enlarged ovary or fruit are seeds. Is that starting to make sense? There are seeds inside that fruit. The fruit is the enlarged ovary, and those are the seeds, the babies, inside. Now, I know you're going, my gosh, what? All right, let's look on page N9. On page N9, let's talk about an apple. Okay, that's a nice fruit. Now, when you look at an apple, this is an apple that's upside down the way from you normally put position it. This is the stem. Anybody know the stem of an apple? All right, that's how it's attached to the plant. Now, at the other end of the apple are just some little fuzzy things. You know what those fuzzy things are? That's the flower parts. Those little things are the little petals and stamens and stuff like that at the other end. This was a flower. Don't flowers turn into fruit? So this is where those of us who live in the city, we are so far away, so removed from the way nature works, we don't really get it. In spring, we see every, all flowers are everywhere right now. There's flowers. We're in the springtime. There's flowers everywhere. And what's going to happen in a few months is there's going to be fruit growing on trees. And this, these are connected because the flowers get pollinated and that forms fruit. That's how it all works. So uh, this was, uh, here's the little parts of the flower. What is this? This is the ovary. And it got really big. And what's inside that enlarged ovary are the seeds. You'd say, say this again. Okay, let's help you again. Let's go back to N6. So here's what we're saying. Here's a flower. You'd say, okay, I got the flower. This picture of a flower looks a lot like these flowers, doesn't it? All right, so you'd say, all right, I understand that. Here's the ovary. Let's imagine this ovary gets really big. So if it gets really big, that's like this. Here's the really big ovary, and there's, uh, we got uh, the, these uh, stamens and pistols, the rest of it is all sticking up right there. That ovary got really big, because a, a flower of, a, of an apple tree is kind of small. So this ovary got real big, and those are the ovules that got fertilized, those are seeds. So that's what you're eating. Now, uh, th now we're going to answer that classic question, what is a fruit? A fruit is an enlarged ovary, and it has seeds in it. So an apple is a fruit, isn't it? Because it's got seeds, and this is just an enlarged ovary. All right. What about, uh, how about a, uh, a peach or a plum? Inside of a peach or a plum, it has just one big seed. It's commonly called a pit. It's a big, so in some, obviously, a, a, an apple has a, several seeds in it. It doesn't have hundreds, but it's got quite a few. Okay, but some, uh, in some fruit, there's just one big seed, one pit, like in a plum or a peach. How about an avocado? Is that a fruit? Yes. Yes, it's got one huge seed. All right? It's got a big pit or a seed. It's a big seed. You can take that seed and plant it, become an avocado plant. Uh, okay, how about a tomato? Yeah. Are there seeds in it? Yeah. It's an enlarged ovary. It is a fruit. Anything with seeds in it. How about a bell pepper? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fruit. It's got seeds inside of it. All right. What about a fig? Um, so it's got those little seeds in it. That's a fruit. Uh, what about a string bean? Yeah. Are there seeds in it? Yeah. That is a fruit. You'd say a string bean? Let's help show you. Look on page uh, N8. N8. So on page N8, this is page N8. This is showing the flower that forms on a string bean plant. Here's the flower. Is everybody okay on that? This is N8. All right. Now, uh, here's, the, here's the flower. We know that the ovary is towards the bottom, right? And we said that if this flower gets pollinated and fertilization occurs, then the ovary at the bottom is going to get bigger. Here it is growing bigger. This is the ovary of the flower. You can even still see 
This is the sticky stigma, the style, and this is the ovary, the expanding ovary. Inside the ovary are the seeds. So it gets bigger and bigger. And here I just colored it in. So this was the enlarged ovary. And there's seeds in it. You call them beans or peas. So that is a fruit. So a bell pepper is a fruit, and a string bean is a fruit, and a tomato is a fruit, and an avocado is a fruit. Anything with seeds in it is a fruit. Is a watermelon? Yeah. Got lots of seeds. Zucchini? Zucchini squash? There's seeds in it. Take a look at the little seeds in a squash. The little white seeds. Anything with seeds in it. Banana? It's got little black seeds. Right? They're small. Anything with seeds in it is a fruit. So this always raises the question then that students will ask me, what's a vegetable? Right? So we just said anything with seeds in it is a fruit. So what's a vegetable? Anything you want to call a vegetable is a vegetable. Vegetable is not a scientific term. The word fruit is a scientific word. If you look at the index of your biology book, I promise you it has fruit listed. It does not have the word vegetable in the index. It doesn't mean anything. Because the way people use the word vegetable is totally random. Most people would say a carrot is a vegetable, right? Well, a carrot is the root of a plant. People would say that lettuce is a vegetable. Lettuce are leaves. A lot of people would say a tomato is a vegetable. That's a fruit. They would say celery is a vegetable. That's a stalk or stem. So what is a vegetable? Whatever the hell you want to call a vegetable. It has no technical mean, meaning. So the, the re reason why this is a, a fake problem, you know, of saying, well, is it a fruit or a vegetable? It's a phony problem because the word vegetable has no specific meaning. Fruit has a specific meaning. We know what roots are. That's the technical part of a plant. The stalk or stem, we know what that is. We know what leaves are. So we talk about lettuce leaves or cabbage leaves. We know that a carrot or a, uh, a potato is part of the root, right? Or a radish is part of a root. A celery is a stalk or a stem. And we know what fruits are, anything with seeds in it. But the word vegetable has no meaning at all. So I have summarized this on the top of N9. On the top of N9, we wrote, that a fruit, a fleshy or dry fruit, develops from the ovary of a flower after fertilization has occurred. Biologists identify a peach, an apple, an avocado, a walnut, a date, a squash, a pea pod, all as fruits, since they all develop from the ovary of the flower. And incidentally, they all have seeds <coughs> inside them. So anything with seeds in it is a fruit. So now you know what a fruit is. So in summarizing, as I wrap up uh, for today, uh, we have talked about a flower. On page N1, we learned the parts of a flower. We learned about the, uh, the female pistil, the male stamens, the uh, petals, and the sepals. And then we uh, also learned on page, page here, On page N6, on N6, we learned the difference between pollination and fertilization. Pollination is the transfer of the pollen from the male part of a flower to the female part of the flower. Uh, from the anther to the sticky stigma. This is similar, we said, to uh, a, a, a guy pollinating a woman, meaning his sperm is now in her body. But that doesn't mean she's yet pregnant. Uh, pregnancy occurs if the sperm that's in her body unites with an egg in her body. That's what fertilization is here, where that pollen unites with the egg. That's fertilization. It forms a baby plant, an embryo. That's called the embryo. That's a seed. A seed is a baby plant. So, uh, and we've also learned that uh, whether it, uh, the, it's the wind that's transferring the pollen or whether it's an insect, uh, we know it's easy to tell which it is because all we have to do is look at the flower. If the flower is huge, if it's uh, brightly colored, if there is a smell, 
All of this is to attract insects' attention. If a flower looks like this, this wouldn't attract an insect at all. This blows in the wind. These are actually flowers. This is wheat and grasses. They, you know, people don't go and hand people, you know, grasses. You know, I brought you some dichondra. Here's the, is that beautiful flowers? No, it doesn't look like anything. So, uh, uh, so not all flowers are pretty. And then uh, finally, we've explained uh, on page, on the page here. Yeah, on page N7, we've explained that uh, the uh, fertilized uh, ovule will become an embryo or seed, and the enlarged ovary is called a fruit. So we know what a fruit is. So now let's just to wrap this up. So here are some fruits, right? Here's some fruits that develop from flowers. And let me see if I could just uh, see if this will show up. All right. And I brought this. Let's see if this will show up. So I went to my little lemon tree. All right. This is a little citrus flower. All right. It's cute. Can you make that out? I don't know. It's a little bit hard to see. Uh, some of the petals are broken off. Can you see the, uh, the uh, female pistil in the center that's very prominent, surrounded by stamens? The pistil, the female part, is the big thing in the center. Now, uh, what happens is, after it's pollinated, those petals fall off. And so then it looks like this. Can you see the, this is the female part of the flower. The petals and stamens have fallen off. That's the sticky stigma, the style, and that's the ovary. That ovary is going to enlarge. And it will enlarge. Let's show it a little bit bigger. And what happens is, as it enlarges, the upper part falls off, so that all that's left is the ovary. Can you see it? OK. Here, this one still has it. Can you see that? So all right, this is the ovary. This part falls off because it's delicate. Now we just have this ovary. That's going to become a lemon. And inside the lemon would be seeds. So then we're asking ourselves, well, so wait a second. It would roses, if you didn't cut the rose off and it got pollinated, would there be a, a fruit? Yes. Now, usually people kind of cut dead roses off, you know, because once it looks like this, right, the petals have fallen off, right, most people just cut this off. But this is going to become a fruit right here if you leave it on, and inside it would be seeds. You know what we call the fruit of a rose? Rose hips. An excellent source of vitamin C. Has anybody ever seen vitamin C from rose hips? Has anybody ever seen that? You'll see when you buy vitamin C uh, in the drugstore, you can get synthetic vitamin C or vitamin C from rose hips. And a rose hip is the fruit of a rose. And that this becomes, uh, it turns orange. So if you've ever seen kind of things that look orange that are all dried up, that's the fruit of the uh, rose. So there's fruits that form on all plants. 